I'm Robert Back here with Chris Antonick and Paul Delorier. We're here to discuss the new song "We're Not Alone" from Chris Antonick's new album Morningstar. Gentlemen, how's it going today? Fantastic. It's going great. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, Paul, for uh, for doing this. Appreciate uh, it. It's a pleasure to be here, man. Even virtually. So, Chris, what is this song about? What's the story of "We're Not Alone"? Musically, I really, I just wanted to do something really traditional and straight ahead blues with this one. The record's got all sorts of other experimental things going on in the blues work, blues rock world. And I just wanted to have really one traditional that really kind of moved fast and that had a lot of energy, but also um, thematically had some, some good messages. This, this song is essentially about self-compassion. So don't be so hard on yourself. Um, looking back at some of the things that I went through in the last few years and saying, you know what? I, I don't need to be so hard on myself. And in studying this kind of idea of self-compassion and reading about it more, it's you learn that that we're all we're all in this together, and we all feel this way sometimes. And that's you know, and then having um, the, the the gospel singers come in and be that chorus, and um, you know, to really hit it home, I wanted to have, you know, I wanted to ask someone like Paul, who's just you know world-class guitarist, I, you know, just to have him help get the message home and get some really nice energy on this song. So. It's kind of a package of those things. Chris, so what made you choose Paul specifically to work on this recording? Paul's just just a great player, like an incredible player, obviously. That's, you know, that's obvious. Um, I've just, I just know him. I've, I've managed to uh, to work with him a few times in the past. We played some shows and he's always been really kind and, and helpful and really nice. And I was like, hey, let's ask Paul. I mean, stylistically, I know that Paul and I have a different style. So I also thought that would be perfect because I'm coming at it one way and then Paul's coming at it another way. And the, the contrast, we don't, you don't, he, it doesn't sound like the same players are, mm -hmm. are um, sort of bleeding together. It sounds really, con there's a nice contrast there. So on that note, how would you describe each other's playing? I think the approach we're trying to get was, was to create a conversation, you know, mm -hmm. between two guitars. And it's, just, it's the kind of thing that, you know, this being, a, a, like Chris was saying, like a standard, uh, more standard sort of blues uh, straight ahead thing. Uh, we guitar players love to do that when we get together and play and jam or something like that. So you go back and forth and you trade licks and stuff like that. So I think the, the approach was to sort of uh, create that kind of a conversation and that our styles are, are different enough that you can hear who's, who's who, you know? And I really kind of dig Chris's tone and especially in this track where it's, it's really kind of, nasty you know in a, in, a, in a really cool way you know in the right way in an old school way where they it sounds like this you know small fender tweed amps about to blow up you know and he's just it's real ratty and 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 yeah. and, and, uh, and real kind of nasty and aggressive and i really like it and you know chris comes from a certain like school you know i know he's a he's a huge clapton fan and and you can hear that that that, that flavor in the conversation and uh you know i come from from another another perspective and and it was real interesting because I hadn't played in a, in a long while when, when he sent this stuff over to me, you know, we were like full on pandemic. And uh, so it, it, we, I think we had a lot to say, even emotionally to yeah. our instruments, you know? Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, having said that, I mean, if, if you hadn't played in a while and then you did that solo, I've imagined what it would sound like uh, having where you are now. It was, <laughs> it's, <something laughs> you didn't tell. It's, it's just, um, yeah, you sent me a couple of takes and I was just like, oh man, this is, I think he sent us two and we chose one of them. And, um, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, we weren't in the same room together. That's where it's COVID and Paul's in Florida, I'm here. But we wanted to create this sense of, um, I think what's great about Paul's sound or the tone that came back is it sounded like a real old school uh, Jimmy Vaughn or, um, you know, uh, Hubert Sumlin or just something, that it sounded nice and legitimate and old and authentic. And we also tried to do that with the, the recording we had a big room lots of room mics and um we just kind of you know tried to create a really good em environment in the uh in the studio all the rest is live off the floor but of course to get paul and i to create that thing in the middle we had to do that on, on top of that but the vibe of the song is very old school big room yeah. lots of mics and just let and at the end it even kind of falls apart if i could piece this together there's two guitar solos the first one is thicker. It sounds like a humbucker, kind of a bridge pickup solo with a lot of saturation. Is that Chris? Yeah, the first one is it's Stratocaster with the Oh, it's a Strat, volume. okay. Strat with a what? One volume down is just trying to get that kind of thick mm. woman tone sort yeah. of inspired heavily by like the, the Clapton from the Cradle 
era, you know, right. of stuff he was doing back then. I, I, that's a big favorite of mine. And wow. uh, I realize that, I, you know, it's, it's just, um, it's, it's reserved and it's just kind of, a, it's kind of just kind of putting these notes out there. Um, and, um, you know, and then, and then Paul comes in with this awesome, I'd say a higher pitched or I'm not sure what pickups you were using, Paul. To me, that I sounds was, like a, oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. No, go ahead, I'll see, see if I was you're right. say, Tell me I hear like a like. surf tone. Like it sounds like a, a small Fender amp, like you mentioned with like a, a spring reverb and like a Strat tone or something like that, single coil. It is actually, uh, it's a 1962 Gibson Melody Maker. Okay. With a, hum, with a humbucker in the bridge. Really? Yeah, that was routed out for a humbucker and it okay. passed you through a, an old uh, Fender Vibro Champ. I okay. threw the amp in the closet, threw a mic up on it, really? and away we went. Yeah. It's yeah. such a so neat sound. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool, but it, it cuts, you know, it's, it creates a nice contrast. Yeah. From what Chris has got this big thick, thick tone, meaty. you know? Yeah. Yeah. And then I, I'm coming in kind of more a little nasally and razory, you know, in, in, in interspersed That's, in there. So yeah. it, it, it creates a nice contrast back and forth, you know? Definitely. Yeah. And, and Paul, Paul played on a whole bunch of, played on the whole thing. And then, um, or I played it in one section. And then on the end, he did so much cool stuff in there. And um, we, I, there was so much of his uh, riffs near the end that I wanted to keep because they were just perfect. I, when I play, I don't necessarily, I wouldn't say that I gets the, the first thing people would say is, oh, that sounds like old school blues. Um, but I, I, I think with Paul's signature riffs at the end, some of them were just so like, oh man, that's old school. That's Jimmy Vaughn. That's Hubert Sumlin. That's that was recorded in the fifties or something. We gotta, we gotta keep those. So it kept all those lines in of Paul's to keep that vibe of the of the sound together. And then, at the end of the day too, you'll notice it's only a three minute song. It's not meant to be. You know, I think we we get a lot of guitar playing in, but at the end of the day, I think we also don't overdo it, which is important too. Because uh, you can do that on stage and you can have, you know, those things can be expanded on stage. I wanted to create this kind of three minute freight train that just kind of comes out of nowhere. And then all of a sudden it's gone. You're like, what was that? You know, like that's kind of the, the vibe that I wanted to put in there. It was modeled after this, um, this Clapton BB King tune that I'd heard uh, that it just comes in and it's just so quick. And it's like, wow, I want to do something like that where it's just, you know, and, um, you know, there's not much to it. It's just a fun song. So how did you two first discover each other? I think we knew of each other for a long time and we're kind of, you know, like anybody who's out there in the work in the work in the scene is you're 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 either crossing paths or coming real close to crossing paths or following each other or, or being on su such and such a festival or whatever. So I'd known about Chris for some time. And I think the first gig we actually played together was at uh, Hughes Room in Toronto. And I'm thinking a number of years ago, maybe Chris remembers better how many years ago it was, uh, but we were it was some kind of a, a uh, thing that our friend uh, Ross Robinson puts together and uh, it was m multiple artists on the same stage on the same night and we got to we got to hang out and play uh, uh, together then for the first time yeah that was that was like in 2014 maybe okay or 15 I think I mean I never I didn't really put out my first piece of music till 2010 as an original artist so I haven't really been at this a long time if you really look at it so when I was first starting to come up I'm, I'd always known of Paul and, and really admired him and he was an awesome player for Montreal and you know and Steve Strongman and Jack DeKaiser and all these folks that you associate with the with the Canadian blues um, you know guitar players I was like man I'd love to play with those guys one day you know and then eventually got to a point where Ross who was doing some booking for me said hey how about we do a double show with you and Paul I'm like sure that's awesome and I believe Paul also filled in for me once at some BB King tribute. I had to bow out for family reasons. Uh, one show here in Toronto, we did a tribute to the three Kings, Albert King, uh, BB and Freddie. And I think Paul filled in for me there. Also, Paul, I think last summer when we played the Calgary Blues Fest, not only did you help me with this song, you also lent me contact lens solution. <laughs> always, uh, always ready to help a friend in need, you know? <laughs> yeah. So there's, there's, there's a, there's old school um, blue solos plus contact lens solution on this mm -hmm. end. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> I was, I had to, I got to Calgary with no contact lens solution and uh, Paul and his, uh, his wonderful uh, wife, Anika, I believe they left some outside the, the hallway at like three in the morning and I went to go get it. So um, I think go on stage with dry eyes, man. Yeah. So <laughs> It's just, you know, optical reasons and musical reasons. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what Paul Delorier means to me. Great. <laughs> 
So how is your recording process different from recording in person? Did the remote recording present any unique challenges? Well, of course. I mean, not not having the energy of performing live with someone in the room and, and getting that immediate feedback, you know, whether we're tracking together, uh, especially if we're going back and forth, you know, trying to have this sort of conversation. It's, uh, um, you know, it's, it becomes sort of a simulated conversation in one sense. Uh, but it, it's it's sort of getting into that mental place where you're thinking, okay, I'm I'm there with them. I got to sort of put myself in that in that mindset that I'm in there with them playing live, you know, as if it's happening. So, and um, that's that poses a challenge. But I think it was during a time where everybody was beset by the same problem. We were all at home, you know, all sort of locked down. None of us were really doing what we what we we're meant to be doing, and and everything was on pause. So we had to figure out all alternate methods of of performing. You know, people were. You know, we were doing this in front of a screen like this for people, you know, uh, playing shows, entire shows that way. So um, yeah. we were all sort of in that same boat. So it but, you know, I have to say as much as it's it's counterintuitive to, to record that way, especially the kind of music that, that, that Chris does and we do, um, it, it was still a huge blessing, you know, and it was really, really good for the soul to be able to make music because we were at full stop and you know, trying to find that inspiration and, and not be depressed about like, when am, when am I going to start my life again? You know, that it was actually a, a, how it was like a little golden nugget from the sky that came and said, you know, Hey, I got a project for you. you, know, you are you into it? I'm like, sure. Yeah. And it gave me something to do and something to look forward yeah. to. And it, it was actually very therapeutic and fun. You know, I kind of felt like, like I was useful again for, for, for a time, you know? Yeah, no, I'm glad you I'm glad you feel that way. I, I know it was a tough, like, man, the last two years were tough. And making this record was not easy. It was a very stressful experience. I mean, there were there were moments where it was so awesome and enjoyable when you get to hear things back. But making it wasn't easy. And as Paul says, we, we didn't really have a choice. And um, sure, you can get in a room with someone. I mean, the other thing is Paul Paul's in Florida. But um, I, I think we were very careful to, you know, having the beds and the piano, especially the piano, it's an upright piano and the room mics and uh, having all that feel live off the floor, it was. It was easy to, to get Paul and I's solos to sound like they're working. So in this case, I, he sends me something back and then I'll just respond to it. I'll, I'll take it back and not overanalyze it, but I'll just start playing along to it. And um, I was able to create a conversation and the solos are happening at different times too. So there's a bit of a, of a thing there. So there, are, there is some, someone called fabrication because it's all real, but that's what we had to do to get that sound. And I think it worked out. There's a definite process of communication and back and forth, like a conversation. For sure. Yeah. And yeah. like like Chris mentioned, it's that I think the idea behind it, as far from my end, was like not overthink it, not overdo it. Don't take too much time. Don't do a hundred takes because you're just going to, you know, oh, I don't like this part. You have to, you have to leave that that spark, and if you try to perfect it too much, then it gets bland and it becomes uh, uninspired. You know why make silver out of gold? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You try to just kind of keep it fresh, you know, by by uh, being spontaneous about it. You know, even though you're at a distance doing it. So. I think I did my leads like after I got your parts back. I booked a studio session and did a bunch of lead guitars that day for a bunch of songs, and I think this one was first. It, like it was like we had to go in early. It was like nine a.m. and I hadn't had my coffee yet. <laughs> <laughs> I said to my producer, I, said, I can't, I can't do this right now. Like I need, I need either, you know, triple espresso or I need Paul in the room or I need like put on some BB King or do something. So I just, I think we did another song that was mellower first. And then I was like, okay, now I can go. And I, yeah. And, you know, did, did a bunch of takes and I was like, yeah, that's the, and, like, and then they stop and you're like, okay, that's enough. There's a few there. Let's, let's pick that one, you know? So, it's, yeah. So again, what's next for you guys? Are there any plans or aspirations for the future? Any chance of a meetup? Sure, I'd love to. <laughs> I don't know the, the, the distance thing. You know, it's it it falls down in uh, the states, and uh, you know, again, we we may meet up at the Maple Blues Awards coming up in June two thousand two. Um, uh, but again, that'll be in the past by the time this airs. So. Yeah, things are well. Hopefully, things feel like they're picking up again. You know, so we're gonna hopefully this summer we'll all have some semblance of normalcy again. And it looks like things are kind of, you know, picking up and uh, I've got, I've got some stuff on the road this summer, both in the States and in Canada. So, um, you know, hopefully we'll get to run into each other on the road, like old times, you know, but we're, 
we're keeping our fingers crossed that this this craziness is over and that we can we can begin again you know yeah for sure it feels like it is hopefully it is yeah well thanks for uh, coming here to join us guys chris and paul great to hear from you it was a pleasure man thanks for having me thanks rob Absolutely. And enjoy the beach today paul oh yeah every day <laughs> Thank you, guys. To check out Chris Antonick's new album, Morning Star, follow Chris and Moondog Music on Bandcamp. Here, you'll get access to pre-release purchases, tour dates, and new material. Thanks for watching.